When you find out the truth about Jesus' appearance, you will be surprised. Was Jesus truly the way we know him? Incredible details of Jesus' looks are included in the letter that Pilate sent to the Roman Emperor Tiberius, characteristics that are not even included in the Gospels. Additionally, he discusses Jesus' miracles, trial, crucifixion, and, shockingly, resurrection in this letter. However, the contents of this letter are unclear. What information on the resurrected Christ and his appearance may Pilate have conveyed to the emperor? As an introduction to his letter to Emperor Tiberius Caesar, Pilate states, Praise be to you, Majesty. I feel obliged to describe in great detail the recent events in my province because I think they may influence the destiny of our empire in the future. These events have been so shocking. It is as if the gods have abandoned us out of nowhere. My life has been beset with cares and difficulties ever since the day I succeeded Valus as governor of Judea. I nearly feel compelled to declare that day was cursed. I immediately took control of the praetorium and set out a magnificent feast upon my arrival in Jerusalem. On the scheduled day, none of the invited guests, a tetrarch from Galilee, the high priest, and his officials, showed up. To me, it was an affront to my authority and the Roman state as a whole. A few days down the road, the high priest paid me a visit, his countenance grave yet betraying his true intentions. His expression betrayed his sincerity as he asserted that his religion barred him from sharing a meal with Romans. It became evident to me that he and his supporters were opposed to the Romans, even though I accepted his explanation. Because these high priests would betray even their mothers for money and power, the Romans should be on the alert against them. Jerusalem was the most difficult city to subjugate out of all the ones we had taken. Because the people are so defiant, I am always worried that there may be a rebellion. Under my leadership, there are just a hundred troops and a centurion. I asked the Syrian governor for reinforcements, but he said he was hardly able to defend his own region with the forces at his disposal. It appears that our capacity to defend what we have already achieved is being overshadowed by our ambition to expand. This worries me because it could bring our government to its knees in due time. For fear that the priests would inspire the rebels, I have shied away from interacting directly with the people. Nonetheless, I have made an effort to comprehend the perspective and worries of this group. Out of all the rumors I have heard, one stood out to me. Word on the street was that a young guy from Galilee was spreading a new religion in the name of the deity who had sent him. My first suspicion was that he was attempting to turn the public against us, but I soon corrected myself. Rather than showing compassion for his fellow Jews, Jesus of Nazareth appeared to have more in common with the Romans. A big group of people had collected around a young man who was speaking quietly while leaning against a tree one time as I was walking through the square. I was not surprised to hear that it was Jesus. After all, he was the most conspicuous of the crowd. I made the conscious decision not to be an annoyance. I persisted in my journey, requesting that my secretary disappear into the mob so I could hear him well. One of my conspirators' ancestors waited in Etruria for Catalan for many years. Luz, my secretary, is his grandchild. I trust him implicitly because he is loyal, speaks Hebrew well, and is also my friend. Upon his return to the Praetorium, Manlius informed me of Jesus' words. The profundity of his remarks is unparalleled in my perusal of philosophical writings. Jesus was asked by one of the several Jerusalem Jewish rebels whether it was proper to pay taxes to Caesar. Giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's is his response. Though I could have arrested the Nazarene or exiled him to Pontus, I chose to release him because of the wisdom that guided me to do so. The Roman concept of justice is central to their government, and it would have been unfair to do so. Neither was Jesus a rebel nor an agitator. Maybe he didn't even notice, but I offered him my protection. Without my involvement, Jesus was free to do as he pleased, talk as he pleased, meet with the people, choose his disciples, and teach. This tolerant attitude could spell disaster for Rome if, heaven forbid, Jesus' teachings eventually supersede those of our forefathers. Unfortunately, I will have played a role in what the Jews refer to as providence and what we call fate. I enraged the powerful and wealthy Jews with the freedom I provided Jesus. 
To me, the fact that Jesus was severe with them was sufficient justification to release him. According to him, the scribes and Pharisees were like serpents. They looked like beautiful tombs on the surface, but they were actually full of dead people on the inside. At other times, he scoffed at regional customs, arguing that God valued humility more than human rank. At the Praetorium, I heard criticisms of Jesus' temerity practically daily. They said that he would meet a tragic end and that Jerusalem had a reputation for stoning individuals who professed to be prophets. Although I was getting ready to submit a petition to Caesar, my actions were ratified by the Senate, which also promised troops following the Persian War. Since my forces were unable to quell an insurrection, I had to find a way to bring calm back to the city without bringing shame upon myself. I summoned Jesus via messenger, inviting him to meet with me in the Praetorium. He arrived. Being of Roman and Spanish descent, I am not the easily frightened or affected. But I was standing on the balcony when Jesus came, and I felt my feet stuck to the marble floor. The Nazarene maintained an air of tranquility that appeared to be innocence itself, while I shook uncontrollably like someone whose conscience was troubled. Without saying a word, he appeared to announce his presence with a delicate gesture as he halted as he neared. This man, a type our artists have never dreamed of when they portray heroes and gods, amazed and impressed me for a long time. Even though I couldn't find anything repulsive about him, I was too frail and elderly to approach him any farther. Jesus of Nazareth, I have not regretted granting you complete freedom of expression for the last three years, I finally said, my voice quivering. You have spoken with great insight and logic. Your rhetoric is significantly superior to that of Socrates and Plato, however I am not sure if you have read their works. I am happy to have granted you the freedom you so well deserve, the emperor is aware of this, and I am his agent here. Your words have drawn strong and ill-informed adversaries, though, so I'm afraid you should be warned. Socrates, too, had adversaries and was a victim of their wrath. Even angrier ones have turned on you because of how harsh your statements were and on me because I let you speak freely. Some even go so far as to say that you and I are plotting to undermine the little civil authority that the Hebrews have under Rome. My advice, not a command, is that going forward, you should exercise more restraint and moderation in your remarks. Your opponents may exploit your ego to rally the uneducated against you and coerce me into obeying the law. Do not be afraid, ruler of the earth, your words lack genuine wisdom, Jesus gently retorted. When you reach the valley center, tell Mount Tabor to halt. Its response will be that it is in harmony with God's laws and the laws of nature. The path of the rivers is known only to him. It is true what I say, the righteous will shed blood before the rose of Sharon blossoms. Your life will not be lost, I responded, profoundly affected. Your knowledge is more important to me than that of the disobedient Pharisees who are abusing the liberty that the Romans have bestowed upon them. Caesar is falsely accused of being a despot bent on destroying his own people by his enemies, who plot against him and spread false rumors about him. The wolf may masquerade as a sheep on occasion to further its evil intentions, but these ungrateful men fail to see this. I will shield you from their clutches. You shall have a holy haven in my praetorium at all hours of the day and night. No place on this planet, nor in heaven, will be able to hide the Son of Man when his time comes. Jesus shook his head and smiled serenely as he said, The sky is a genuine haven of safety. He went on to say, The prophecies will come to pass while pointing above. I said, You are pressuring me to transform my request into an order, expressing my concern. This province's security, which is my responsibility, requires it. Your speeches need to be more measured. There will be repercussions if you disobey this command. May joy be with you always. Goodbye, ruler of the world, Jesus proclaimed. Peace, love, and generosity are what I came to bring, not trouble. Augustus Caesar's rule brought peace to the Roman Empire, and I was born on that very day. Even if I am not directly responsible for the persecutions, I am prepared to endure them all in the name of doing what my father has commanded me to do. Use caution before speaking. 
You are helpless to prevent the victim from being sacrificed on the altar. His presence was too much for me, so I was relieved when, after saying this, he faded away like a light on the horizon. The elderly ruler of the day, Herod, joined Jesus' adversaries in their quest for vengeance. Even though he was proud to be king, Herod was afraid of losing favor with the Senate and would have ordered Jesus' execution if he had been left to his own devices. Maybe he was afraid of Jesus just as much as I was, but no Roman official could ever admit to being afraid of a Jew. During his visit to the Praetorium, Herod inquired about my thoughts on the Nazarene as he got up to depart after a brief but meaningless talk. Rome had decided to allow Jesus free speech since his deeds did not warrant punishment, and I countered that he seemed to be one of those great sages who occasionally come in big civilizations. Moreover, his teachings were not about politics. Herod bowed ironically and departed, flashing me a sly grin. As the Jewish high holiday of Passover drew near, there was a plot afoot to capitalize on the usual public upheaval that swept the city at this time. A raucous throng demanding the crucifixion of Jesus swarmed the streets of Jerusalem. The exploitation of the temple's treasure for bribery was exposed by my sources. A Roman centurion had been openly embarrassed just as danger was about to strike. I wrote to the Syrian governor, asking for 100 foot soldiers and 100 cavalrymen, but he turned me down. Surrounded by a hostile and rebellious city, I was alone with few veterans, unable to quell a potential rebellion, and left with little alternative but to weather the storm. One of the charges against Jesus was that he was a rebel. Despite being aware that there was no need to be afraid of the praetorium, they were led to assume that I was trying to cover up the insurrection and continued yelling, crucify him, non-stop. Peel him off. At that very moment, the Pharisees, Herodians, and Sadducees banded together to oppose Jesus. The Herodians and Sadducees seemed to be acting ambiguously for two reasons. First, they despised Jesus, and second, they were afraid of the Romans. I made a terrible error that day, but they would never forgive me for sacrilege because I entered the sacred city with banners bearing the image of the emperor. Another disagreement was also heating up between them. The Pharisees, who were already opposed to Jesus, rejected my proposal that some of the temple's treasure be set aside for public works. Because the Nazarene had been so critical of them for the previous three years everywhere he went, they didn't care much for the government and held anger. Not only did I have to deal with these factions, but also with the careless and disobedient general public, who seemed to be waiting around the corner to rebel or take advantage of a situation. In light of this, the high priest took Jesus before him and condemned him to death. In an apparent display of submission, the high priest Caiaphas sent Jesus to me at that same moment so that I may affirm the judgment and guarantee the execution. I told them that Herod should decide since Jesus was from Galilee, so I had him brought to him. Herod, acting so modestly while pretending to respect Caesar's emissary, returned the choice to me, putting all the blame on me. My palace was surrounded in no time at all by an ever-increasing band of rebels. A multitude of people descended from the Nazareth mountains and engulfed Jerusalem. It was as though the entire city of Judea had gathered there. Tearfully, a galaseer knelt at my feet and shouted, Beware! You think you can see into the future, don't you? This dude is holy, so keep your distance. In a vision I had last night, he was gliding through the air on the back of a windmill. The lake's fish and the storm both listened to his voice and did as he said. The morning light rose like a virgin in grief, the sculptures of Caesar wept, and blood filled the river on Mount Catherine. A terrible tragedy is on your way if you ignore your wife's warnings. Stay away from the Roman Senate at all costs. Be afraid of Caesar's thrones. As they returned Jesus to me, the marble stairs of the praetorium quivered under the weight of the throng. With my bodyguard close behind, I strode up to the halls of justice and demanded an answer from the assembled masses. Every single person said, Jesus is death. What kind of wrongdoing has he done? I inquired. He has claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God, the Jewish King, and has blasphemed and foretold the temple's destruction. I responded that no one was ever put to death for such charges in Roman justice. 
crucify him, yelled out, though. Even the palace walls trembled as the cries of the incensed mob reverberated through the air. Only Jesus kept his composure among them. The decision I took seemed to be our final chance of rescuing him from his opponent's fury after multiple failed efforts to do so. During the festivities, it was common practice to propose rescuing a prisoner. I did the same with Jesus. Nonetheless, the crowd insisted that he be beheaded. I made an effort to dispute by stating that they were acting illegally. I brought up the fact that by Jewish law, a judge couldn't condemn a defendant without first fasting for a whole day, and that the Sanhedrin had to approve the sentence with their signature and assent. No death penalty may be carried out in this court on the same day as the sentencing. On the day of the execution, which was to follow, the Sanhedrin was to examine the whole procedure. In addition, according to their law, one man had to hold a banner outside the courthouse, while another, atop a horse, had to announce the name of the convicted man, the crime, and the names of the witnesses, requesting that anyone might attest to his innocence. The condemned prisoner might have three opportunities to re-argue his case before his execution. I tried to reassure them by stressing these factors, but the chance of crucifying him continued unabated. They insisted on crucifying him. I thought that ordering Jesus to be flogged would satisfy them, but it only made them hate him more. In front of the incensed mob, I prayed for a basin and cleansed my hands, announcing that, in my opinion, Jesus of Nazareth had not done anything to merit death. But it didn't matter what I said. It was already decided that Jesus would die. The ferocity of crowds and civil unrest that day was unlike anything I had ever seen before. All the demons in Hades appeared to have congregated around Jerusalem. Unlike any disturbance I had ever seen before, the mob was propelled and twisted like a whirlwind as it surged in violent waves from the Praetorium Gates to Mount Zion. Records, it does not indicate that they are sacred writings to many churches with the exception of Alexandria and Corinth in addition to what Paul and Thala do from these texts. The one that we'll examining today is the letter that Paul wrote to their empire this gospel of ours, which is included in this is what happened when the disciples saw Jesus in scriptures, Paul made a quick and sincere apology to him. It clarifies that Paul recognized him when he heard his voice, but he why isn't he able? To perceive Jesus now, clear as day, even if he might have the opportunity to hear him preach during Jesus teaching Jesus when he is on earth lofty is like a raging inferno the brilliance of which masks his genuine expression when he spoke everything smells, but you can hear it from a multitude of streams, and as a result, he failed to identify the caller until he admitted to John that it was Jesus. Actually beheld Jesus as recounted in the scripture who have woolly white hair and are part of the book of Revelation golden feet that shimmered with a combustion engine a voice resembling that of a radiant face and rushing waters seeing the brilliance of the sun. He correct in interpreting the Bible story provides details on Paul's buddies who could make out the speaker's voice but for they are spiritually blind and cannot perceive instead of experiencing actual blindness refrain from go around this blind area by entering a direct communion with the divine and he shall permit god to be shown to you in all his a great sin is one that has obliterated your vision every trace of it will be eliminated today regardless of your feelings toward his followers regardless of what you do god will still love them he will lead you into eternity through his way praise be to god if you trust in him and believe he has the power to transform your life at this very moment, then you ought to probably a prayer would be a good next step. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Chronicles of Blacks to get your daily dose of hidden history. When you were living in the shadow of someone else's story, did you ever feel as though you were being ignored or unloved? Illness is something that Leah, the biblical matriarch who has been forgotten, is all too familiar with. What if, however, I told you that it was Leah, and not her more cherished sister Rachel, who was the one who played a significant role in the establishment of the lineage of Jesus Christ? Her narrative is one of unanticipated redemption, a manifestation of divine purpose, and a legacy that altered the path that history would take. The following is the account of Leah, the woman whom God loved and cherished. 
The beginning of Leah's story takes place in the ancient land of Mesopotamia, in a household that is heavily influenced by her shrewd father, Laban. As the older sister of Rachel, Leah was also a daughter of Laban, who was a master of deception. Rachel was Laban's daughter. The Bible says that Leah had weak eyes, which has been interpreted in a number of different ways. However, the most likely interpretation is that it represents the fact that her appearance was less striking in comparison to that of her younger sister Rachel, who was known for her beauty. Leah's life would be filled with comparisons and emotional suffering as a result of this difference in appearance, which set the stage for her. Jacob, who had fled to Laban's household in order to shelter himself from the wrath of his brother Esau, fell deeply in love with Rachel the moment he laid eyes on her. In an effort to secure Rachel's hand in marriage, he consented to work for Laban for a period of seven years. Due to the fact that Jacob loved Rachel so much, the Bible says that those seven years seemed to him like only a few days, Genesis 29 verse 20. On the other hand, when it came time for the wedding, Laban tricked Jacob by sending Leah in place of Rachel while it was still dark outside. Jacob's anger was fueled by the fact that he found out about the deception the following morning. It is not customary to marry off the younger daughter before the older one, Laban explained as his justification for his actions. After that, Laban made an offer to Jacob to take Rachel as well, but only on the condition that Jacob would continue to work for her for another seven years. A heartbreaking situation was created for Leah as a result of this arrangement. A man who did not love her and who had been duped into marrying her was now her husband. He had been tricked into marrying her. In the biblical account, the suffering that Leah endures is palpable. Because she was living in the shadow of her more beautiful and beloved sister, she must have experienced a profound sense of being unwanted and rejected. However, in spite of these challenging circumstances, Leah's life took an unexpected turn, one that would have an impact that would last forever. In his compassion, God saw the predicament that Leah was in. Genesis 29 verse 31 provides the following information. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. In a society in which the value of a woman was frequently determined by her capacity to have children, this was a tremendously fortunate circumstance. Because of her fertility, Leah found a source of significance and hope in her life. It was through her that Jacob was blessed with six sons and one daughter, all of whom would go on to play important roles in the establishment of the twelve tribes that comprised Israel. See, a son, is the meaning of the name Reuben, which was Leah's firstborn child. As Leah explained, it is because the Lord has seen my misery, which is the reason why she gave him this name. Genesis 29 verse 32 says, I have no doubt that my husband will love me now. Due to the fact that she stated, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. Genesis 29 verse 33, her second son was named Simeon, which means one who hears. Her third son was given the name Levi, which means attached, because she had the hope that Jacob would become attached to her after the birth of three sons, Genesis 29 verse 34. Even though she had high hopes, Jacob's heart continued to be with Rachel. Additionally, the story of Leah is a story of God's faithfulness, despite the fact that it is a story of unfulfilled longing and profound sorrow. While it's possible that Leah experienced feelings of rejection from her husband, God did not reject her. Instead, he blessed her in ways that would have significant repercussions for the direction that Israel and the world would take in the future. Not only would Leah's role as the mother of Jacob's children ensure her place in history, but it would also lay the groundwork for a lineage that would eventually result in the birth of the Messiah. An important turning point in both Leah's life and the biblical narrative occurred when she gave birth to her fourth son, Judah. Immediately following the birth of Judah, Leah's perspective started to change. Up until this point, Leah's primary objective had been to win Jacob's affection by means of the successful delivery of her sons. An expression of her anguish and yearning for her husband's affection was reflected in the naming of each of her first three sons. The presence of Judah, on the other hand, shifted Leah's attention to God. During the time that Leah was giving birth to Judah, she uttered the words, This time I will praise the Lord, Acts 29 verse 35. 
Leah's heart underwent a profound transformation, and the name Judah, which means praise, was a symbol of this transformation. Leah made the decision to praise God for the blessings that he had bestowed upon her rather than continuing to seek validation from Jacob. Leah underwent a profound spiritual transformation as a result of this event, as she began to discover that her identity was not established in the love of her husband, but rather in her relationship with God. The birth of Judah was not only a significant turning point for Leah on a personal level, but it also had far-reaching implications for the future of Israel and the world of the entire world. In the end, Jesus Christ would trace his lineage back to Judah, who would become the mother of King David. There is a surprising and powerful detail that highlights the grace and sovereignty of God, and that is the fact that the Messiah would come from Leah's lineage. Despite the fact that she was the weaker of the two wives, Leah ended up becoming the mother of the tribe that would eventually give birth to the Savior of the world. This change in Leah's perspective, from seeking human love to offering praise to God, provides a profound lesson in the importance of faith and contentment. The story of Leah teaches us that the way to find true fulfillment is not through the approval or love of other people, but rather through our relationship with God ourselves. It was when Leah stopped trying to win Jacob's affection that she discovered a sense of peace and purpose in her life. Instead, she turned her heart toward God. Leah's choice to praise God in the midst of her difficulties had repercussions that extended far beyond her immediate existence. The legacy that Leah would leave behind would be one of kingship and redemption through Judah. The promises that were made to Abraham that his descendants would be a blessing to all nations were fulfilled through the line of Leah's descendants. The tribe of Judah ended up becoming one of the most prominent tribes in Israel. The narrative of Leah serves to remind us that God is at work in our lives even when we are experiencing suffering and being rejected. Not only did her choice to praise God rather than concentrate on her challenges result in a transformation of her own life, but it also had a significant impact on the history of Israel and the world. Even in situations where life does not go according to our plans, the legacy that Leah leaves behind is a demonstration of the strength of faith and the significance of maintaining our focus on God. Within the context of the establishment of the nation of Israel, Leah's position as the mother of six of Jacob's twelve sons places her when it came at the to very the consequences of, of their process, actions. Simeon and Levi, each of her sons, Leah's would second eventually and third become sons, the leader of a tribe, also held and together they would form the twelve the tribes of, Shechem of Israel. Was the target of their violent These vengeance, tribes were which extremely they carried important out after in the, the history of the Dino Jewish was people as well as God's assault. plan to redeem humanity. The intense rage and violence Although that Reuben, they displayed Simeon, prompted Jacob, and Levi, who was on his first three sons, to curse them and declare that destinies. they would be dispersed it was her and scattered fourth son, throughout Israel, Judah, who Genesis would carry 49 the greatest verses significance in the biblical seven. narrative. The fulfillment Judah of this prophecy was the son occurred who would carry the greatest of Simeon became one of the smallest tribes and King was eventually and absorbed ultimately, into the tribe of Jesus Judah. Jesus Christ would be among the descendants of Judah the tribe during of Levi his lifetime. Was designated as the it is one of the most surprising but they did aspects not of Leah's story land. that the Messiah, the Savior of Both the world, Issachar would come Zebulun, from the line of the less favored wife, sixth sons, rather than from Rachel in the establishment of Israel. This they is one of the important roles that makes the story very interesting. In the book of First Chronicles, Despite chapter the fact twelve, that verse thirty-two, firstborn it is stated that the descendants of Issachar were his renowned for their wisdom and their comprehension of the times. Him from his position as On the, the other hand, Zebulun's By tribe settled near the sea and Bilha, became famous one of Jacob's for their maritime skills he brought and trade. Upon his father. Despite and the as fact a that these tribes are not as prominent in the biblical narrative, each of them made a contribution to the overall strength and diversity of the nation of Israel, which is extremely important. The legacy it was that Leah leaves behind the first mother of these tribes is significant. Who have been given the authority to Leah's children became the foundation of the nation through which God would work out his plan for redemption, despite the difficulties and rejections that she encountered. A testament to God's faithfulness and his ability to use even the most difficult circumstances for his purposes, the story of the twelve tribes of Israel is a story that demonstrates both of these things. The fact that Leah played a part in the establishment of the twelve tribes serves as a reminder that God's plans frequently take shape in ways that we do not anticipate. 